let's get it started. Good morning, everyone. So, who amongst you hit a party yesterday? I did as well, so I really appreciate that you are here such early in the morning, taking also into account that there are so many great talks in parallel, so I feel appreciated. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with, about myself. Uh, just a few words. My name is Jakub Pilimon. I'm a software developer, trainer. I run a blog. Uh, here is my Twitter handle if you want to drop me a line. We're going to see a lot of code today, but all of the code is available at my GitHub account if you are interested. Just feel free to take a look. Um, I have a question for you. Who amongst you have ever used Spring Cloud Stream? Hands up. And who amongst you have ever heard about CQRS? Event sourcing. OK, th throughout the next uh, 50 minutes, I'm going to sell you those three buzzwords, OK? Uh, we're going to start with event sourcing, CQRS. We're going to end up with uh, Spring Cloud Stream and how they play well together. Um, first question, um, not first, but uh, later question. Uh, is anyone who's not speaking Engli Polish here? OK, so you're going to stick with English. Um, Let's start with, uh, with stuff that we, we as a developers feel comfortable with, at least partially. Who amongst you have never used Hibernate? That is what I expected. That's good to know. Uh, now when you get to know the audience, uh, I have a question. How it works that uh, our domain objects are being hit with, the, with method calls and then the, the results are being replicated in and our database. So what's the name of the mechanism that keeps track of the fact that something has changed in our domain, and then it has to be replicated to, to our database? Anyone? This picture was supposed to help to name the mechanism? Dirty checking, Dirty checking. thank you. Uh, I was supposed to, to throw out this uh, picture because no one ever guessed, but thank you. It's obvious, right? Dirty checking. Dirty clean. So how it works, uh, you know what, uh, to be more precise, I will show it on a li live example. Uh, we have a, a new shop item with status ordered. Is it visible, by the way? Cool. Uh, we change the status to paid and we save it again. And we're going to do something marvelous because we're going to debug internal stuff of Hibernate. Sounds cool, doesn't it? I'm going to run the debugger, and we're going to uh, end up with a, in a method called dirty check, who is supposed to check whether something has changed or not. You see, we are in dirty check method over here, which was called upon flash entity. And basically, Hibernate has two, uh, uh, two array of objects to compare. One of them is the clean snapshot that was uh, stored and not touched uh, when, when the object was loaded from the database. It's being stored in an array called loaded state. The second array of object is the current state. So the state uh, when we want to flash to the database and do dirty check. It's called values. And as we can see, uh, they, of course, differ because we changed something. So the dirty check worked. Uh, it, it kept track that something has changed and something has to be replicated uh, in the database. We're going to see it later on. Because I enabled Hibernate logging, we're going to see that Hibernate was able to generate uh, two statements against our database. One of them is insert, because we called a new constructor. And second uh, is update, because we basically mutate state by calling a setter on our domain object. So as we can see, Hibernate was able to uh, deduct that something has changed and emit small deltas of our domain objects, small changes that are uh, that are a result of calling something in our domain. This uh, picture is also not hangers from, uh, from wardrobe, but this is a Greek letter delta, OK? So Hibernate was, uh, was able to deduct that something has changed and throw uh, against our database SQL queries like this. And one question to you. Uh, what happens if we have such a problem? We come to an office uh, on Monday, and we're going to check the log statements throughout the weekend. And there's a sheet load of exceptions going on, like stack traces all over the place. Business keeps asking us why the hell our application didn't work at weekend. And we don't know, because on Monday it works. What we want to do is to uh, repli uh, replicate the, the, the bug from the weekend, but the state moved on to Monday. So we cannot debug, because a uh, sheet load of stuff ha has happened to Monday. We cannot say to Hibernate, hey, please, 
load me in an object, but from the state of Saturday, just ignoring, let's say, the last two deltas. Just give me the first and two, because that is when Saturday ended. We cannot do that, because this is basically delta, which is fire and forget. Run against database and forget about it. We cannot do that, so maybe let's get mad for a while and think about it. If we uh, tried to implement such a mechanism ourselves, would, be, would it be hard? Let's think about it, because we exactly know what happens with our domain objects, right? The new instance uh, of ordered shop item was created, and then uh, basically we call the setter, so we mutate state, we change state to paid. So, if we instead of calling uh, dirty check and firing and forgetting about SQL statement uh, re represent our deltas in something like this and store them somewhere, let's for a while do not talk about where we're going to store it. We're going to talk it in a few minutes, but let's, let's think about it, that we, we have this kind of delta. And we store them uh, as JSON somewhere. And later on, we can take as many deltas as we want so that we can replicate state at current, at current point of time because every delta has a timestamp as a parameter. You know what, to be more precise, let's uh, show it again on a real life example. If we had the shop item uh, and the method pay, which is basically an equivalent for calling a setter and mutating state, if we also emit a delta over here, which is called item paid, and store it in our internal collection of, of changes, deltas, or let's start, call it, let's start calling it domain events, then every mutation would, would be represented also in our internal collection of changes. Now, if we had to implement a dirty check mechanism, it's basically fairly simple, because we, what we have to do is when we are calling save in our repository, Basically, dirty check here means check whether there's something in our internal collection of changes or not. This getter returns me the internal collection of changes. Whether the object is dirty or not, it's easy, because we all only have to check whether our internal collection is empty or not. If it's empty, then the object is clean. We don't do anything. If it's, uh, if it's not empty, then the object is dirty. dirty. Dirty check works. We store delta to our event store, and. One more time, we're going to talk about event store for, uh, in a few minutes. And at the end, we also have to flush the, the changes. That means now our object is clean again. The internal collection is empty. So now what we, what we uh, can do is we, can, we could store our single shop item deltas in one place, in a row, like this. We, we now taught our mechanism to emit deltas as a result of calling a domain objects uh, method. But what we have to do is also, it, it's also teach them how to interpret those deltas upon loading from the event store, okay? That would mean, we know what, what's, what's going on because it was new constructor and, and a setter. We know that the first delta represents calling a constructor and the second delta represents calling a setter on the result of calling the first delta, and so on and so forth, up till the very end. Or till the middle, because the middle means, for, for example, Saturday. And doing this like, like that, we can recreate state at every possible point of time. And we can debug what happened on Saturday and, uh, and res uh, respond to our business, what was going on, what the hell was going on with our application uh, in the, at the weekend, and correct it. Basically, if there is anyone who likes functional programming over here, uh, this consuming of this event stream is basically left fault. Intermediate state, mutation, intermediate state, mutation, up till the very end. So we also have to write the code that, um, that interprets those, del those deltas. When I see delta item paid, when I'm applying that on my domain object, upon loading from our event store, I have to mutate my state. That means calling a setter, we already know that. So now not only we can go back in time and create state at every possible point of time, but we also got something for free. Let's take a look. We have a very technology agnostic 
audit log of our application, right? Because we're going to see there that this sing single shop item instance was ordered, paid, cancelled, reordered with specific timestamps. So we have audit log, possibility to go back in time, but there is something more. Let's go back to our uh, Hibernate example. And I have a question for you. Um, if the previous example emitted two deltas, insert and update, how many deltas will this example emit? Hands up. How many deltas? One. The same as the previous example, right? Yeah. Yes, we basically lost the information that something was called in the middle. It's obvious because Hibernate doesn't give a shit about this set status paid. It checks the state at the point of flashing. At the point of flashing, it has status of cancelled. So it, co it compares cancelled with the, with the initial state stored in a snapshot, right? So we have basically the same scenario here, insert and update, two deltas. We lost this information that something has happened in the middle. Whether it's important or not, or not it's of course our business need decision. But it's, uh, it's important to know that ORM systems lose this kind of information. It wouldn't happen uh, in our event source model, because basically every method call would, en would end up uh, as a result in, in our internal collection of changes. The previous example left our database state in the same, uh, in the same state, going from different paths, different directions, and we don't know which, uh, which way it came from. It's important to know that, that uh, this kind of a system does not lose information. It's the, first, uh, it's the third advantage. Audit log, going back in time, do not lose information. There's something more here. Uh, last that, but not least, if we take a look at this code, uh, it's basically left free from any Hibernate annotations, right? right? I have only Lombok annotations because I like Lombok, but I could de-Lombok that and see that it's just pure object orientation or functional programming if, you, if we want. So there is nothing going on here when it comes to ORM mapping. Nothing. So we don't have to do trade-offs in our domain because we have to uh, keep in mind that our, our objects will be mapped to relations. We don't have to care, care about Hibernate over here. We can do and practice just functional or object orientation. So there is no impedance mismatch between object orientation and relational world. Do we really, as programmers, always understand both worlds? They are different, right? Relational, packed by mathematics and object orientation, backed by good design practices and so on and so forth. And also, do we understand the bridge between those two words in the form of Hibernate or any other ORM, right? So this is the fourth advantage. No impedance mismatch. We're going to talk about drawbacks, don't, no worries, later on. Uh, let's go back to the presentation. Uh, let's stop for a while and uh, talk about events. Let's talk about events. Uh, who amongst you have ever used or seen uh, this kind of a code? I have an entity, I call a method, I mutate state, and at, uh, at the end of that mutation, uh, of that method, I also throw out an event so that any other component can subscribe to it. It's a fairly well-known pattern, right? Especially from DDD community, but just also object orientation, like an observer pattern. There is one problem with that pattern, right? If we think about it, uh, Let's say that uh, someone subscribes to that event and throws an email to a client saying the price of that, of that product has been cut. Maybe you would like to buy it right now because I know you were interested in it. And now it's cheaper. Let's buy it. But if we uh, create this delta, this domain object, in a wrong, wrong state, like here, instead of taking the first parameter as price, uh, I've taken percent because I made a mistake, as every developer does, then basically everyone who listens to that event is being lied to. And every client that gets the, the email is being lied to as well. What is the source of that problem? Uh, the source of that problem is that we have two different sources of deltas. One of them uh, are deltas emitted by Hibernate as the result of the field mutation, uh, price mutation, 
that later will be checked by and caught by dirty checking and uh, run against our database or any other data source. The second, of, uh, second kind of deltas, it's our manually created deltas in the kind of domain objects, domain events. Two different sources of truth. They, have, uh, they don't have to be in match, they can clash somewhere. In event source model, it's not possible because we only have one source of delta. So we can throw it out and give it to anyone who wants to listen to it. They will be always in match. Of course, we could uh, unit test this behavior, right? We could write a unit test for every single uh, domain event that we, that, we, that we raise in our domain. That would require us to have more tests. Uh, talking about test, unit testing, test for this uh, price change would look something like this, right? Initial state, method signal to our, to our domain object, effect, the, uh, the resulting state. What we test here, we test the, the delta, right? We test the, the change that will be later on replicated by uh, hibernate del dirty checking to, uh, to our data source, right? What I'm going to say is that in event source model, it's fairly the same. The mind shift of unit testing when it comes to uh, when it comes to event sourcing and event source model is equals to zero because we have initial state we run a signal to our uh, to our domain object and then we test what has changed how many deltas was emitted were emitted one two or three but this this model has one big advantage versus the previous one. If we took a look deeper, let's think for a while. This test checks me that only one delta was emitted, not zero, not two, not three, not gazillion, but one. So I'm testing that the price was changed and nothing else here. Versus the previous test checks whether the price was changed. It doesn't check whether something else haven't changed by accident. In other words, in other words, God bless you. In other words, uh, it doesn't check that something that I don't expect to happen didn't happen here by accident. So this model uh, has an advantage over the previous model. And if we think about it, these are not new ideas. These are not new ideas because, uh, w for example, how database works. How database works. It uh, has the internal transaction lock or write the headlock or in MongoDB it's called optlock or something like that. I don't really remember, but the, the idea is the same. The idea is that when we write transactions to our database, it keeps storing it in an in a append-only lock, event lock, so that when it goes down, it can check uh, whether, it's something to, uh, whether it has something to complete or rollback. That gives us ACID guarantees, atomicity, durability, and so on and so forth. So databases already use event sourcing. These are not like new ideas. But the world is not an ideal place to live, right? Let's talk about different scenario. Let's talk about the problem. Uh, let's say we have to run a query against our event store. Now we're going to talk about event stores. Let's say we have those deltas uh, serialized to JSON and uh, stored in a relational DB, like in a one table called, called events or deltas with columns, timestamp, uh, payload, and for example, object ID, because we have to match somehow delta to a specific object, right? And we have a query. How many queries would we have uh, in, our, in this model? We would have always select from events where object ID equals to something, and maybe where timestamp is lower than Saturday, if we want to recreate state from the past. Uh, from the past. When we insert new deltas, it's basically insert into events where values something, 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 right? I don't I'm not really good at SQL. Uh, so basically, we have two or three uh, queries in our event store to optimize versus 30 lines of uh, SQL generated by Hibernate. But this has a drawback, because how would I uh, run this specific, very complicated report, which says, Give me all of the shop items that has price lower than 50 slots. How would I do that with my deltas? 
Let's say I have one gazillion of deltas in my, uh, we have one gazillion of uh, deltas in our MySQL cluster, or H2, something like that. What we have to do is basically load them all, recreate state of all of the shop items, filter those who, uh, who meet the requ required behavior of having the price lower than 50, and return uh, the resulting set. Let's say there are two of them. Basically, it means that every time we want to query something, we have to do table, full table scan on table of events. It doesn't scale, right, does it? But people came up with something different. People came up with uh, an idea that maybe the model that we use to write the data to our database should be different than the model that we read, that we read data from our database. This is basically what uh, CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation, stands for. Maybe our model in both directions do not scale simultaneously. Let's talk about Twitter. Who among you uh, have used Twitter in 2012? Who among you have used Twitter two years ago? OK, thank you for raising your hands. Uh, Twitter in 2012 almost collapsed because they ignored the fact that the model to write uh, data to and to read data from might not scale in both directions. What they used was a MySQL cluster and Ruby on Rails also, that's why also it almost collapsed. Um, and uh, they have several tables in their MySQL uh, data source. Amongst them, they were table users, um, followers, tweets. So that when someone goes to, to Twitter and wants to uh, see the home line, the Twitter application did basically a simple query. User ID, the one who's logging in, join all of the followers that this person has, join all the tweets of all of the followers that this person has. So two joins, right? Fairly simple query. They had like 4,000 uh, requests to post tweets so to write to uh, write of database to database, at the same time they have like 300,000 reads from database, so request to load the home lines of users, so two orders of magnitude more reads than writes, and they use the same model. Basically, it was third normal form. Who amongst you uh, was taught at university to do third normal form because otherwise you will fail the test? I also was taught like this. Third normal form is good when we write stuff down because it has uh, the least amount of redundancy. And they optimized it uh, for, free, for, for 400, 4,000 requests per second to write, at the same time having 300,000 requests to read data. And those joins didn't scale. So they came up with a different idea. When someone, user John, let's say John has a um, Twitter account, and and he has 10 followers. When John tweets something, in an old-fashioned way, uh, it goes down to the MySQL cluster, but at the same time, it's being distributed to caches, to cache of all the, excuse me. Okay, it works, cool. Uh, I'm gonna hide the, the, the cursor. At the same time, it, it's, uh, it's being distributed to, to Redis cache and copied to all of the 10 followers. So at the time of writing a uh, post, uh, a tweet, down to the database, Twitter application does 11 writes instead of one. So that they can scale when reading databases. Because now what a, new, a user has to do when loading her or his home line, it only has to go to the Redis cluster and load from the key value. That's it. It scales. Accidental complexity was removed by choosing the different model. Let's go back to our shop example. If we had something like this, uh, this scenario, we have our shop item, uh, which emits deltas to some kind of a transport layer, let's say it's message broker, whatever. There is a, a consumer of this, uh, of, this, of this deltas, of this domain events, we call it UI. It's gonna build its internal view based on the deltas that are being thrown by its shop. It looks like this. 
hey, here's my event log, deal with it, do whatever you want with that. You can build your own internal view of that as you want for your needs. So that, for example, you can run a query and check whether the price is lower or bigger than 50. This is the model to read data from. And the beauty of event sourcing and this kind of uh, collaboration uh, in the form of events is that anyone can have different projection on, on, this, on this event log. This is basically a real life example also, because this is how uh, people used to argue and like in their relationships, right? There's an event, past event log of a relationship and there's always women and men that have different thoughts about different event log logs in the, in the past. It's always like that. Hey, honey, this, you did something. No, I didn't do did something. I did something else. You have different projection of the event log in our relationship. I used to tell that to my ex-girlfriend. Now it's my ex-girlfriend. I don't know why. Because she didn't understand event sourcing. And I did. Let's go back to our, to our code. Uh, let's run this application. And by the way, I'm running a Kafka cluster uh, underneath. And uh, you know what? First, let's talk about Spring Cloud Stream for a while. Because Spring Cloud Stream is a marvelous stuff. It allows us to connect our services that, like, that would like to connect by, uh, and talk by messaging infrastructure. And what we need to do is basically two things. We have to specify an abstraction in the form of channel we can see here. Let's say we have a channel called items. And every method that is annoted like this, and in, when it's being invoked, the channel of items will be populated uh, with the resulting parameter of that method. The question is, what's the message broker? This is the beauty of Spring Cloud Stream. It's whatever you have on the class path. Let's say you have a binder to Kafka cluster on a, on a, on a, on a, on a class path. That means Spring Cloud Stream will try to connect to Kafka and to a topic called items. When you change the, uh, your class path to, let's say, RabbitMQ binder, it will try to connect to exchange called items. This is basically the producer side. At the bottom, we, are, we see uh, the consuming side. The consuming side says, OK, this method will be invoked, invoked whenever a broker sends me a message. Whatever it is, RabbitMQ, JMS, uh, Google pops up Hornet. I think there are more, more and more integrations going on right now because it's firmly a uh, new product. This is all we have to do. So we can easily build this kind of scenario uh, with Spring Cloud Stream, just specifying channels and having specific binders in the class path. And you know what? Let's run it uh, so that you will see I'm not lying here. I have a, this shop uh, that's going to emit uh, random deltas every five or two seconds, I don't remember. It's going to connect to Kafka cluster in a while. At least I hope so. Yeah, it's, it keeps sending some events, you see, right here. And now we are going to run uh, the second application, which is basically the shop UI. I'm going to run it on a specific port. This application doesn't have hibernate, doesn't have dirty checking. It only has like JDBC template to, to read data from database, like a fin, fin layer. And it crashed. I guess it's because of the port. So let's run it again. So what, what we're going to see is that uh, this application will consume all of the events from the very beginning and build it, its internal state. The beauty of that, as you see, we are getting the events, and as you see, uh, there is, we can run multiple applica applications like this. Let's actually do that. Let's actually uh, change our consumer group ID, which says, I, didn't, I forgot to change that. Uh, let's say we have the same application, but we subscribe to Kafka with different consumer group ID. That's the, that's the only thing that we are changing. Plus, we change the port so that it doesn't clash. The beauty of that scenario is that we're going to get all of the events from the very beginning as well. The same application will connect to Kafka and get all of the events. That means 
we'll get the same state in both replicas. We'll replicate our, uh, our, our database, and we can have load balancer in front of them, and basically scale our reads from, from our application independently from the writes. So this is asymmetric scaling, horizontal one. We can do something different. If we run second application with the same consumer group ID, basically two consumers gr uh, group ID will be the same, the application will be the same. And Spring Cloud Stream will uh, deduct that this is the same application and will do failover for us. Because as we can see, this one uh, keeps getting events, but when it crashes because of, I don't know, out of memory problem, the first one will take over in a minute, yes. So this is failover, horizontal asymmetric scaling. Let's talk about databases as well. How does MySQL, Postgres replicate themselves? It's firmly the same. They have this replication log, and when there is a new replica to build, it's like, hey, here's my replication log. If you want to be me, just replicate this replication log, and you will get the same state. This is the same scenario. We can have replicas, and we can have failover. With this scenario, we can do something more. Because let's say we have to develop a new feature here in our UI application. We are about to change our internal model f uh, a bit so that we can uh, do a different kind of report, something like that. We did uh, all, of the, all of the stuff, and now we want to test it. What we can do is we can run it on production environment not allowing the external client to connect it, but just to deploy it in production environment, we could uh, assign experimental uh, consumer group ID and basically run it. What it will do, it will uh, see that uh, it's just fairly new consumer group ID so, ID, so it will fetch all of the events from the very beginning with the new model that we are developing right now, as you can see. It will get the historic events, so the historic state. It will keep getting the live data as well. It's on the production environment. So this is fairly good test suite for our uh, new feature, right? Production environment, historic data, live data as well. When we are getting fairly comfortable with that, uh, with that new feature, we could allow 10% of our users to connect to this replica, to this state, right? and 90% to the oldest one. That means we have A-B testing, very, very easy one, because we don't share databases. These are different databases, so this is something like shared nothing architecture. It would be firmly uh, more, conf more complicated when we have one database, it would have to deal with backward compatibility, forward compatibility, and so on and so forth. Here we shared nothing, that's why it's so easy. And when we get like 100% uh, comfortable with that new, uh, new feature, what we can do is shut down the old, the old stuff, the old application, and put the, uh, put the load to the new replica. And what we have done right now is deploying a new feature with zero downtime, right? By the means of blue-green deployments. Blue replica, green replica, we switch the how it's called? We switched the switch, I guess. I was like, how, how I was supposed to end that sentence? It switched the switch, right? So blue-green deployments, zero downtime deployments, A-B testing, horizontal asymmetric scaling failover, just because we are communicating with events, uh, and Spring Cloud Stream allows us to do it fairly easy. There's something more, because let's say we have, uh, we have a problem that there is a sheet load of events. Like, I guess it's not visible, right, guys? Do you see it or not? It's cool. <laughs> I don't see it from here, so <laughs> I'm impressed. Uh, but I think I remember what was written here. So <clears throat> when we have like v uh, load, lots of events going on, and let's say we are sending um, sending emails as a result of even being thrown. And we have one application 
that basically cannot handle this, this load. With Spring Cloud Stream, it's fairly easy to, uh, to fix that. Because we can say, OK, I'm a producer of that event. Here is my parti partition key, for example, object ID. And at the producer side, I can say, OK, I'm the consumer group one uh, and with the instance of zero. And the other one is consumer group one, instance of one. And Spring Cloud Stream, of course, backed by Kafka or any other broker uh, underneath, will do sharding for us for free. Where there's, where there's like a um, hot stream of events, we can easily shard it uh, throughout our application, throughout our system, not application, because these are distributed systems, right? Let's talk about performance. Because there's always this question, OK, what happens if I had like gazillion of events in my event stream related to one single shop item instance? And now I have to change something. So that means I have to uh, recreate state. That means I have to fetch them all, this gazillion of deltas, and produce the state so that I, I can run a setter or something like that. That doesn't scale, right? But people came up with an idea of snapshotting. That means, let's say we have 1,000 of events, and every 100, we store a snapshot. So when, when, when uh, 1,000 first and second event comes in, and we want to recreate state, basically we take a look at the last snapshot, which is at the point of 1,000. We take it, and we apply the two newly created events on top of that. This is basically how databases also work when they replicate themselves. They have periodic snapshots as well. But I don't understand one thing. When people talk about snapshotting, uh, an event source system. I think they forget about something which is very important in event sourcing. Because the beauty of event sourcing allows us to forget about state. And the state is just a projection of our events. The moment we try to use snapshotting, we are coupled to state as we are with, with ORM. Because snapshot is state. It's not delta, it's just specific state. So the moment we want to uh, change the way we project our event source model at the writing stuff, our snapshots become invalid. We will have to recreate them. I think it's very important to, to remember that, that snapshotting means uh, having a drawback in our model. But there is also a good part of it. There is a good part of that performance, because uh, question to you guys. Let's say we want to serve our domain events via REST service, so that everyone who is interested would, pulling, would be pulling uh, our endpoint and checks whether there is something new or not. Basically, it's the same scenario as Kafka works. Kafka is not push-based, it's pull-based. So the consumer uh, is responsible for pulling, periodic pulling with an offset checking, hey, maybe you have something new uh, and w which is more than free, because the last event I've seen was free. Give me everything new. This is the responsibility of a consu consumer in Kafka. It's client-based subscription versus Rabbit, which is, for example, server-based subscription. Uh, but let's go back to this REST example. If we wanted to serve it via REST, and uh, we are serving this event log, those immutable events that keeps growing in our log. What kind of a cache control we can set uh, to our, basically to our consumers? If they are immutable, that means we can cache them forever, right? I mean, probably HTTP specification doesn't allow caching forever, but I think one year uh, it's valid cache, because it will not change. So if you've seen this event, you can keep it. And every intermediate server can keep it. So we can uh, take advantage of whole HTTP and REST infra infrastructure, right? There's also a good part of it that I recently learned from uh, the presentation of Greg Young. That uh, Greg Young is a, is, a, is a guy who, who builds event stores. And basically, what they say that uh, 
If we take a look how we actually uh, read and write to our, to our event log, it's basically sequ sequential, right? Because we are reading from the very beginning up till the very end, or up till the, till the middle, because we want to recreate sta state from the, from the middle. So we always read in sequences. We don't read random deltas, the first one, the last one, then something in the middle, always in sequences. When it comes to writing stuff, it's firmly the same, because our domain object, when it's uh, invoked with a method call that change states, that means uh, emits new event or new events, because it can be multiple events as a result of calling a method, it's always being appended at the end of the event log, right? Not at the beginning, not in the middle, but always at the very, begin at the very end. So it's also sequential. And what I've learned is that those event store are fairly fast because uh, basically our disks uh, prefer sequential reads and writes than random ones, right? So it's faster. Those event store, event stores are more performant than uh, the normal DBs because they upfront without no, uh, no data inside know how they will be used. Because everyone will use it like this. Give me the events related to, um, to this object and write events down as a result of a change and map it to this object. So they know. They don't have uh, use case specific queries. Up front they know how would, will they be used. So it's fairly easy to optimize them. And the beauty of that is that they, they are like uh, business agnostic, because we can st uh, store any kind of business inside of them, because everything is this in this payload of JSON, right? All we need to do is to, uh, to map specific delta to specific object ID, and we have to provide the specific unification of, uh, of object identifier throughout all of our, our domain. That's it. Let's talk about this, uh, this picture. What we have built uh, in that scenario, apart from the front end, because I'm I really lame at front end, so I cannot build it. Uh, it's firmly this. We have three uh, three parts of our application. First of all, we have the shop application, which is the database and and storage for the right sites. So for storing events. This is where we want to uh, build our domain, object orientation, functional programming, whatever we want. This is the, the, the stuff that does the business. This stuff emits events to every possible sub, uh, subscriber. For example, UR, UI, which is the read model that we show on the front end by the means of DTOs. The front end would like also to change something, let's say, uh, to order a shop item. So it has to run the commands. This model allows us to have very well bounded C losses for our teams, right? There is a front end which connects by commands to our write model and by DTOs for our, from our read model. And there is a write model that takes commands. And as a result of throwing a command, it emits events that are being later on uh, distributed to all of the read models. And read model is just a thin layer of our with, with database of any kind, with no ORM, no dirty checking, no transaction management. Why do we need transaction management when we read stuff from the database? Transac transaction will be, will be uh, invoked by database, probably or we can just use read-only transaction, because we don't need transaction, like normal kind. Let's talk about pitfalls more. First of all, it breaks relationships, true stuff. Second of all, uh, the snapshotting, right? When we snapshot stuff uh, in our event log, we are basically coupled to state again, so we lose the, the beauty of event sourcing when we want to change the state change the way we project state from our events at our right side, we have to basically recreate snapshots. 
very big drawback of that scenario is that when we model our objects, our events, our deltas, and they land on production, basically they are there forever. They are immutable. We cannot change them. We cannot throw them out. We cannot recreate them. So it's like a, let's say, very valid audit log of our mistakes as developers, right? It will be always there. And when it comes to business problems, when we want to correct something, we cannot run periodic SQL scripts during the night because it doesn't work here with deltas. What we have to do is we have to run like a compensation events. So the event that will roll back the effect of the first event that was, that was there uh, first. Compensation events are not easy. It's like an accountant, right? It doesn't correct uh, stuff. He or she always uh, runs a compensation transaction. Next big problem with this kind of a system is that what we have to do when we want to version our events. Let's say our domain keeps growing and our deltas has new stuff. We have to somehow map the previous stuff to the new stuff, the new version of our event. It's not that easy to do. It's basically all of the problems that we have when versioning an API. Because we have to uh, map it internally in our right side to populate state, but also we have to somehow uh, tell all the consumers that, you know what, we, I have a new version of the event. Maybe you would like to consume that, and maybe you cannot right now because you don't understand it, but others understand it, so we have to do it in parallel. It gets complicated when it gets to, to versioning events. So versioning events, compensation transactions, not easy stuff to do. Uh, I once seen a, a proof, co proof of concept of, uh, of event sourced system that basically was CRUD based system. I think it was like an overkill uh, because CRUD based system in any kind of a language we can do like in 15 minutes with specific uh, frameworks. So it's valid and important to understand that whether our domain is uh, complicated enough to deal with, uh, to, to use this kind of uh, persistent mechanism. That would be it. Thank you very much for attending this session, and uh, we have time for Q&As, at least for Qs, maybe for As as well. I will see. Um, if you, there are any, now is the time. If not, I'm here till the rest of the day. You can grab me or drop me a line at, at Twitter. Questions over there, on the left. Uh, can you please give a use case for compensation in an event? Because usually the beauty of the secure S is that you can alter something and then replay all the events. And that's why you don't need to roll back the transaction, actually. OK, um, I think it's, uh, these are two questions. First of them is, uh, then an example of a compensation event. It's, for example, when we uh, did something wrong in our application. It populates our event store with a wrong event. For example, I did a transaction to the other account, and it was wrong. So I have to correct it somehow. That means running an event that will have a transaction with the negative amount of the first transaction, because I cannot run a SQL script right? that corrects our database. And, uh, with the CQRS and the read model, if, we, if you kept replaying all of the events, that means you will get the compensation event as well. And you will have the correction in the read model as well. Does it answer the question? You can just note. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions, guys? There is one. Okay. Uh, so you said that we can leverage the fact that events are immutable by uh, incorporating cache on HTTP level. Yep. And um, the cache is effective if uh, you have enough hits. But I would assume that with uh, enough number of events, every consumer has a, there's certain variation between offsets every consumer has. So is that an issue? Is that, uh, 
when we have a lot of events, a lot of clients, is, can cash be effective? Uh, I think yes, because every of the clients will have to start um, read from the beginning. So everyone will have to consume the events from the beginning. Whether they are a tenth, a hundred, and one thousand, they will have to consume the first events. So they will be in the cash. Because we, uh, well, when we have these aggressive pullers in HTTP that keeps asking for new events, they will uh, in turn populate our caches in the web. But that is a valid point, what you have said. Uh, for the new events, it doesn't work. For the first uh, consumer, it will, of course, will have to hit the, the producer. But then later on, when a new model comes in, it can leverage the fact of the cache being hit. Thanks. There is a question. No, oh, thank you, but there is a question. <laughs> uh, continuing this cache uh, questions, uh, is it uh, really needed to store all the events if we are start playing uh, some uh, things from the snapshots? Uh huh. Uh, yes, because of the problem of the snapshotting. If you if you change the way you you project the state at the right side, then the snapshot becomes invalid. You need the the events from the very beginning. Plus, you would like to have an audit log, right? from the very beginning. If you remove the events, you don't have the audit log. I don't see you, but I don't know if you, if the, yeah, that's cool, thanks. Okay, if there are no questions, I would like to thank you one more time and wish you all the best for all the, all the conference. Bye-bye.